Good day, my friends. And here we are for IMC celebration of Earth Day. In uh, Buddhism, uh, we don't call it Earth Day. We call it Earth Care Day, where the emphasis is not on simply appreciating, valuing, celebrating this Earth that we live on, but also our role in caring for it. And <clears throat> part of the Buddhist emphasis uh, is to emphasize human responsibility more than human rights. Both are very important, but sometimes the idea of rights um, uh, blinds people, blinds us from the, our ability to respond, our capacity for sharing and building and creating a better world for everyone. And the, what we're learning so much is that how interconnected we all are and that the welfare of others is clearly important for our own welfare. And our welfare is important for them. And how do we care for the world, the earth, and how do we care for ourselves so it's mutually supportive is one of the big tasks of our era, of this generation of people. We're living in the remarkable times. I mean, we all know that. It's uh, no one, I don't know if a few people could have expected this even a few months ago. The radical ways in which our societies, the whole globe, the whole globe has been changed in unimaginable ways. And, uh, and to some degree, it's been a global pause. Uh, many things have slowed down, many things have stopped, and many people, not everyone for sure, but many people are not doing many of the normal activities they would have done before. And it is a, and in this global change, that uh, it's an opportune time to rethink uh, how society is organized, how governments run, how we care for the earth, how we live, live our lives now. There's an opportunity now to change in ways that probably were unimaginable that we could change, even just a few months ago. I mean, it is just what's happened now is, as I said, was unimaginable, and, but it has happened. Uh, people who were environmentalists who wanted us to use less airplanes. Airplane traffic is down 90% apparently. Uh, use less fossil fuels. There's a little bit of a crisis in the oil industry because people are using a lot less, um, you know, oil and gas. Air has gotten cleaner. Waters have gotten cleaner. Animals are happier, apparently. Uh, the anecdote is a story of the pandas. I heard that in the zoo where they're trying to mate the pandas for 13 years, um, they finally got mated in the last few months, last month or so. And uh, the theory is that uh, when they're finally left alone, maybe pandas don't like to mate uh, on display. And so the zoos are closed and they're left alone and quieter and, and, they, could, um, and they could mate. So kind of a nice kind of representative story of maybe the natural world uh, uh, renewing itself uh, without the uh, re ongoing onslaught of uh, human society and its insatiable consumption of goods. So Earth Day is a day to appreciate the natural world. And, and uh, I was very surprised a couple of weeks into the sheltering in place, to walk outside here in Redwood City and ex breathe the air in a way that I've never br breathed the air before here. I think it was a combination of all kinds of factors that made it so fresh and so alive and had little elements of uh, the sea coming in as well. And um, it wasn't just that there was much less car pollution and factory pollution, but certainly that contributed to, without that, I wouldn't have been able to feel this beautiful fresh air that felt like it was um, medicine. It felt like it was healing and helpful and beautiful, wonderful to breathe. And I reflected how, you know, 100 years ago, probably less for many people, 
Um, this was an ordinary part of human life to have fresh air in most places in the world. And that um, the, uh, you know, in a sense, it was a right that people had, a right that didn't have to be a right because the air was clean. The, um, and that's, you know, representative to me of so much that has, uh, we've lost. Uh, we've lost so much. We've lost clean water. Uh, clean air. You know, some of the places that, that have, have most polluted air right now in the United States are places I wouldn't have imagined w- uh, myself. I mean, Los Angeles still has a lot of pollution, but Fairbanks, Alaska, and Chico, California. And some of that, especially for Fairbanks last year, had to do with fires. Uh, that they, the part of particular matter that came from fires has elevated quite a bit. And this idea of, you know, the air becoming clean. And quiet, boy, I just love the quiet that I'm experiencing now. Certainly no leaf blowers are very few. I don't hear the regular uh, airplanes dry- flying over, which is really nice. And uh, there's lots of much traffic. And uh, it's really something to uh, to experience uh, uh, the, the quiet. And also the space, the spaciousness, all the space. Um, and looking back to my growing up, I grew up in different countries and different circumstances for sure. But uh, I look back at that time, maybe an innocent time compared to now, and I remember there'd be much more space than uh, what I experienced in the San Francisco Bay Area, where there has been so much traffic and so many cars and people. But now it's, the streets are kind of empty. Sometimes I walk in the middle of the street just because I like all the open space around me. And, um, and you know, it's no cars coming, so might as well enjoy the space, spaciousness. And the other day I was walking down from my house, down the hill in the middle of the road. And there was a little intersection, and there, with the intersection, kind of sharing it with me, was a four-foot heron. Who could have imagined a four-foot heron, uh, you know, on the asphalt, on an intersection? And, uh, you know, we looked at each other, and I stood there for a while, and enjoying it. And it was kind of a wonderful pleasure. I think 50 years ago when the first Earth Day happened, um, there's, you know, there's been 50 of these now celebrations. And uh, perhaps this is the most sober one. And sober, I think, in the, in the sense that in both meanings of the word sober, uh, it means serious and um, solemn. It's a serious time we're in. It also means free of alcohol to be sober and free of addiction. And uh, you certainly, our society is addicted to consumption. Addic- we can see it, you know, addicted to oil production, oil sales and oil usage because of the huge need for um, employment in the oil industry, for profits in the oil industry, for stockholders in the oil industry. It just goes on and on and, you know, and all this. And this addiction to these things, you know, abated. Certainly with a lot of suffering, which has to be taken seriously and considered. But to, but to have this sober time, this very serious time, very important time, crisis time, that is giving us an unparalleled opportunity to rethink everything, including our relationship to the earth, to the natural world, the more than human world. The more than human world, the natural world, the earth, is not a passive uh, uh, entity. We can't just kind of keep using it and, and uh, exploiting it and polluting it uh, as if it's just a passive recipient that just can absorb it all. Uh, as the this Gaia, this Earth, lives in this amazing homeostasis trying to come back and forth, it rebounds, it reacts, it responds, the Earth, to what uh, is done to it. Especially at the scale which humans can do it, do it now, that scale, which wasn't really that relevant long ago. Um, wasn't, wasn't here so long ago. There's a very uh, odd teaching that I had never really understood in early Buddhism. There's just a few, one or two places in the text where they make a reference, not even a teaching, it's just like a, a concept. It says that the earth, uh, that human beings have the idea of six consciousnesses. There's eye consciousness, air consciousness, taste, smell, body consciousness, tactile consciousness, and then the consciousness or awareness of the mind. 
so there's six consciousnesses. And the teaching or the concept is that the earth has only one conscious. Uh, and so it doesn't explain what that is, but it's kind of intriguing, the idea that earth too is conscious. And perhaps it's t- a tactile consciousness in that uh, what is done to the earth physically, materially, physically, uh, the earth responds accordingly. And uh, it's some way or other, it's responsive, it changes, it, it uh, things die, fall comes, spring comes. Um, and um, and we sa- it's said now repeatedly that because of how much human beings have pushed into the natural world, that it's having an impact that's affecting us back. Uh, all the fires in California that we've had in recent years, uh, partly because we've moved into places that are fire zones and without setting up proper safety me- measures or pushing too far into it. Um, we have uh, uh, polluted waters. Uh, we have crisis, water crises in this country and certainly around the world. Uh, rivers that can no longer be drunk out of. Rivers that are so polluted we can't even swim in it. In this country, some of the poorest people in the country, um, in, uh, in uh, Detroit, for example, Alabama, and in uh, Central California, there's a major water crisis. Either there is no water, the water is very, very polluted, full of lead, full of all kinds of things. And so we put things into the water, pollute it, and it comes back. We put uh, uh, chemicals into the soil, pesticides and uh, herbicides, and it percolates down into the groundwater and it comes back. That there is this kind of rebound, this cycling, this returning that goes on. And the earth we know is this phenomenal uh, 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 complex ecosystem that constantly is shifting and moving into homeostasis. But if we contribute too much uh, into that homeostasis, then we affect it, the rebounds, it changes things, and that change then can affect us. Our health depends on having clean air. Our health depends on having clean water. Our health depends on having uh, just the right balance of fire, not too much, not too little. Our health depends on having um, the land be harmonious, be intact, be a system, the earth system, that's something that, then what grows on the land, something that lives in harmony and supportive. I grew up uh, in a town, part of my growing up in a city in Italy called Trieste, the top of the Adriatic. And we would drive down the coast of Yugoslavia, back then Yugoslavia, the Adriatic coast, sometimes for the weekend and to go visit some of the little islands there. Beautiful islands on on that uh, Yugoslavian coast, because now it's Croatia, Serbia. Um, They were beautiful, but they were beautiful because they were so stark. They were barren for the most part of soil. They had been um, filled with soil and forests, and the Romans came in and cut down the forests and grew grapes. And still, back in the 1960s, uh, you can go diving in some of the little harbors, um, bays, and um, you could see all these Roman shards on the ground. Uh, some people found whole bases that had been lost f- overboard from uh, held wine. And, um, and it, was over, it was over-farmed, and the, and the soil washed away, and now it's stark. Much of the islands of Greece, the same thing. Um, Mesopotamia. There's all these places in the world where human beings have stretched and overdone, uh, overutilized the environment and destroyed it and destroyed the very things that's uh, subs- uh, their subsistence, the very things that supported them. So humans have a long history of doing this. This is not a new phenomenon. It's just a scale now is at a global level. And this uh, coronavirus is an indication, uh, symptomatic or represent- representative, of the phenomenal ways in which we're interconnected, phenomenal way in which uh, we influence each other, affect each other, and connect to each other for better or for worse. And with the coronavirus, kind of for worse. You know, people are dying. People are trying to figure out how to stay alive and having a tremendous damaging effect on the economy. 
And, uh, you know, I think that the coronavirus easily could be the, uh, the first of a number of crises that come. So, rather than being Earth Day, for Buddhists it's Earth Care Day. And the idea that we're caring for the Earth um, is the same for Buddhists as caring for ourselves. That these two are intimately connected to each other, okay, inseparable. The more we care for the Earth, the more we care for ourselves. Uh, and for the people we love. There was a remarkable study that was done a few years ago when um, they had the Olympics in uh, Beijing. Uh, Beijing is one of the most polluted cities in the world. But for the Olympics, for three months, they cut back on uh, cars and factories, uh, car driving and factories, so to clean up the air for the Olympics. And so for three months. And during that time, uh, in China, they did studies about the effect on health uh, for, you know, this clean air. And one of the things they found is that uh, uh, that during that time of clean air, or during that time, in the wake of it, that women uh, who are pregnant uh, stayed in gestation longer than the average had been for many years. Uh, and the babies were larger and heavier. In other words, there was a correlation between smog and uh, and uh, uh, how long you know uh, birth uh, uh, gestation rates for human beings? That smog it doesn't come you know cost free. It has a huge impact on our health, and we don't pay attention to it enough as a society. We're willing to have pollution and smog in the Bay Area go up to Chico and go down to Fresno where it affects people who have asthma. Uh, We're willing to have uh, dirty water. We're willing to uh, destroy pieces of land and have soil soil erosion that destroys it even more. Our society as a whole is willing to to live with a lot, a lot of damage that is unhealthy for human beings. There's a trade-off. Is that a trade-off we want to live with? Do we have, do we, we have human rights but do, does everyone have human right to health services, to clean air, to clean water? Uh, is that a right that we should prioritize? And are there human responsibilities where we as a society, as a community, uh, provide that to each other, really guarantee that everyone has, has health care, everyone has clean air, clean water, clean earth? And how do we do it? So this is where this pause, this global pause we're in, I very much hope that everyone is deeply, emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, philosophically, politically influenced by what's happening right now. That we don't go back to how things were. That we begin some serious conversations, serious study, <clears throat> but how we can live differently, how we can do things differently. If we go back to what we had, <clears throat> you know, it's you know, it's going to get awful. It's going to get worse. Climate change. The word climate change is just kind of a polite word to say that crisis after crisis is going to come. And even how much has changed now, uh, which is kind of like an environmentalist dream, how far we've come for these, you know, six weeks or something in terms of reduced consumption, reduced pollution. Turns out it's not enough. And if that's not enough, I mean, we, you know, doing even more is going to disrupt the economy. And we don't want people out of work. So how do we form an economy, create an economy that's robust, that's dynamic, that supports people, where people feel that they're used in good ways and, in, and being supported, that also takes care of the environmental health of our planet. This idea that we're in it together and that it really requires us to think it out. It's something that uh, I have put a lot of hope in, not from the uh, leadership from the top down, especially at this era, but from the ground up. Uh, That uh, uh, we have to all not just contribute by recycling, that's just 
is almost ineffective the way it's going on, the recycling in the last years, but something much more radical that we do. And um, I was struck by a figure I saw recently that a few things, you know, I saw that half of the United St- population in the United States lives and breathes dirty, dirty air. Half of them, amazing. And the people who are poorest have the most bad air. The bad air the, by the poor are the people who have the least voice. The earth has no voice for itself. It doesn't vote. Those who have the least amount of voice, who are not heard, are the people who suffer the most. How do we listen to the people who don't have a voice? So that they they count and they're supported and they can be helped. And then there are, uh, but there are all kinds of ground up things. There's a lot of people involved with solar power. Probably not the, the, uh, should be seen as a solution or the solution. But uh, apparently in 2016, there was $100 billion in investment for solar power in, around the world. That's pretty impressive. I'm impressed by the scale of money that's being used these days. I mean, wow. Let's use it wisely. Let's use it carefully. Let's be smart about this and really think out how we do this. Because if we want to become free... We want freedom and liberty. There's no liberty, from Buddhist point of view, there's no liberty without caring for others. If we're not interested in the welfare of others and the world, liberty is actually a kind of, is actually the opposite. From Buddhist point of view, to have freedom to do whatever we want without it being uh, any inf- uh, in- uh, interest in the consequence it has in the wider world is actually to be uh, caught in the opposite of freedom. That there's something about caring, about being interested, about that comes out of freedom, that's part and parcel of that freedom. If you want to know if you're free, See how much you care about others. I once asked a Zen teacher um, of mine, I said, uh, how do you know if someone's enlightened? And his answer really, for me, was quite powerful for me. So how would you know if someone's enlightened? He said, uh, uh, if they help people. There are certainly people who help others who are not enlightened, so it's not the only criteria. But if that's the first criteria, how do you know that you're maturing in the Dharma and practice? Sooner or later, and it can be later because sometimes self-care is really, really important. There's certainly a time to go deep inside, like during your meditation time. But rather than caring for others, caring for the earth being an obligation, rather than it being a responsibility that's a heavy weight, through freedom we discover an ability to respond. We have a response ability, an ability to response that can flow out of freedom. And that is peaceful. That is not weighed down by duty or responsibility or weighed down by all the difficult emotions that come um, with, you know, being in the world. There's a freedom, there's an ease, there's a peace that is possible. That might not be popular because we're supposed to care by worrying. We're supposed to care by being angry. But that's not necessary. But if you're free, if you discover it the freedom of the heart, that freedom of the heart gives you an ability to respond from that peace, from that freedom, from that sense of well-being. 
as we discover spiritual well-being, emotional well-being, that's, that is, that's responsive to the world. The earth is responsive to how we act and our liberated heart responds to how the world is. So Earth Care Day, the day to care for the world. We use our meditation practice, the Buddhist practice, to prepare ourselves for what's coming. And what we want to see is a well-prepared world. Crises are coming. How do we prepare ourselves for it? How do we prepare ourselves for it spiritually, emotionally, psychologically? And how do we prepare for it as a society, as a global community? These are the tasks of our times. This is the challenge that of our times. I suspect that this, the challenge of this is as big or maybe bigger than some of the major challenges of previous generations that I've known. Challenges of World War II, challenges of World War I, challenges of the Depression, 1930s. What's happening now is on that scale. And just as those times required so much of the people of that time, this is our time to be the generation that cares, to be the generation that makes a difference. May it be that Earth Care Day be every day for us. Thank you.